we welcome you on this Easter Sunday. The celebration of the resurrection from the grave of, of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. This is, in spite of what some people think, the most important of our celebrations. Easter is the culmination of salvation. Christmas is only the beginning of the story. And we have yet another part of the story to come, but that hasn't occurred yet, so we can't celebrate it. That is, coming of Christ again. This is also the week in which the Masters golf tournament occurs. And for some people, um, they have trouble a little bit. We got some golfers out in the Narthex Lounge, I know, and some other of you are golfers. And the Masters is a big deal. CBS has televised a lot of Masters. And when, on those few occasions, the Masters uh, finals has coincided with Easter Sunday, they've taken a bath when it comes to the, uh, the ratings. Too many people out having Easter lunch or whatnot to be watching. So one year when the head of CBS Sports uh, realized that the Masters Finals were going to be at the same time as Easter, he said to his staff, we got to find out who sets Easter. we got to get him to change it. <laughs> they uh, pointed out to him, because he was not a really religious person, that that wasn't going to happen. Even in the sports world, you're not going to change Easter just because it coincides with the Masters. Instead, they've intentionally tried to make sure that the Masters does not fall on Easter. You know by now, from the drama of Easter, how it all unfolds, two days earlier on Good Friday, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified by the Roman authorities at the instigation of the religious authorities. He was nailed to a cross. Later on, a sword would pierce his side. The soldiers affixed a sign above his head that said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Death actually came for him relatively swiftly, about six hours' time. Whereas uh, very often, men who were crucified would actually languish for several days at a time. Commentators believe it's probably because of the brutal um, whippings and beatings that Jesus endured previous to his walk to the cross and his crucifixion. In any case, he died in a relatively short period of time. He died before the sun set, which was important because the Jewish Sabbath started, and even if he had died after the Jewish Sabbath had started, his body would have stayed on the cross. He could not have been buried, according to Jewish law. And so everything that happened was going to have to be done quickly. And we have some surprise characters show up. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. He was on the Sanhedrin. Um, and he was involved in asking for Jesus' body. And so was uh, a man by the name of Nicodemus, a Pharisee, who shows up early in the account of John, coming to Jesus at night. Um, after darkness, sort of to shelter his questions so that people didn't realize he came. We're surprised, in a sense, that these two leaders of the Jews came to Jesus, and evidently the message stuck. It was a message that got into their hearts. And they were willing to do something that perhaps threatened their own lives, and that obviously threatened their reputation. That is, going to seek the body of Jesus. We often forget that at the time of the crucifixion, anyone who stood up for Jesus at that point was putting their life on the line. It's a challenge to us in our own day in society, even though it may be a little bit tougher to be a Christian than it was 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, Still, most of the time, people wouldn't even guess we are Christians by the way we live our lives. Joseph was a wealthy man, a pious man. We know he was wealthy because he allowed his own personal grave to be 
um, used for Jesus. We know he had to have been wealthy simply because only rich men could afford to have their graves made in the side of a hill, chipped out of stone. Very costly. There is sort of a, a joke about Joseph of Arimathea. Someone has said, a couple of weeks after the resurrection, someone said, why did you allow Jesus to use your own personal tomb? He said, well, he only needed it for the weekend. <laughs> now at the time that happened, he had no idea. The fact is, many times we struggle because we forget that Jesus died as a penniless preacher. He had no place, as we are told in Luke 9, he said, uh, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He had no place to be buried. He's buried in a borrowed tomb. And we're reminded that God often takes unexpected turns. We'll touch on that again. Because after all, everything that happened on that Easter was unexpected, even though Jesus had tried to prepare his disciples for it. So now we come to that first Easter, and John writes, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Very beautiful and significant words, while it was still dark. And I think all of us have to agree that before the resurrection of Jesus, the world was a very dark, dark place. But even now, it is a dark place in much of our society because people do not know Jesus. Life for them just ends. They have no hope for eternity. There was a widely known Baptist preacher by the name of Carlisle Marley, Marley rather, um, well-known preacher, uh, preached for very large audiences. He once made an appearance at Duke University to preach, and some students came to him and asked him to say to them a word or two about um, the resurrection of death. They were all um, enrolled in Duke Seminary. And he told them no, and they were shocked. And basically what he told them is, I'm not going to waste my time talking with you because everything in your lives is probably very theoretical. You've been through no tough times. You've probably not lost anyone of significance in your life. You haven't had the failures that occur to adults. You don't know what it is to live in darkness yet. What you do know, then you'll understand the power of the resurrection. Now maybe he was being a little bit hard on those students. But at the same time, I think many of us would understand that until you've gone through something very difficult, you don't understand what it is to have something break in and change your perspective. Many of us have gone through experiences where suddenly we have discovered that what we thought was a low point in our lives has become a great joy. I've known grandparents who were really troubled because one of their grandchildren was born out of wedlock and maybe it was a scandal and whatnot, only later on to have that little kid become the joy of their lives. Sometimes the difficulties become a great joy. God is at work transforming darkness into the light of the resurrection. So we read, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb because they had not really been able to prepare Jesus' body for burial. They'd done a very quick job of it so that they could get his body in the tomb before the Jewish Passover started. She got up very early because he felt there's a lot to do. And maybe partly because Jesus was arrested at night. He was tried in a place where they were not able to be with him. He had died alone on a cross away from his friends. She had not had a chance to say goodbye. And maybe in her own heart she wanted to spend some time 
if not with her Lord, at least with his body, doing what she could do. Now we know she wasn't alone because other texts tell us that there was a group of women who went. But it was black. It was dark. She may very well have been starting off while it was very dark. She may have tripped along the way, stumbled. And a lot of times in life, we feel like we're just stumbling through life. And yet she is going to have an experience that blows everything up. But first of all, we are told when she arrived, she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance to the tomb. And this really had to have been a punch in the gut to her. This is unexpected. And again, I go back to the idea that oftentimes what we feel is a big failure or a big defeat or a big disappointment somehow, by the grace of God, gets transformed. She's not going to know it for a while. In fact, she's so caught up in her despair and hurt and her crying that when Jesus appears to her later in the text, she doesn't even recognize him. And again, remember that sometimes God's grace comes in very unexpected ways. We see her running back, telling the disciples, we see Peter and John making their way, following. John, being younger, perhaps gets there faster. He stops at the door. Peter, being Peter, just bursts in. They look around. We're told that they believed, but they didn't understand. And I want to have you think about that for a minute. Believing and not understanding opens us up to full understanding. Because a lot of times, if we don't believe to begin with, we're not going to understand as things unravel. When Mary hears her name called by a familiar voice, the recognition is there. When we believe, very often we begin to be listening with different ears, seeing with different eyes. We begin to see God at work in our lives, even when we're not expecting it, simply because we believe. So even though they did not understand, we're told that they believed. It's a dark world out there without Easter. No truer statement can be made. Without Easter, what else is there to do when you contemplate, contemplate the loss of someone who loved, all you can do is cry and grieve. Some of you have experienced significant death in your life, and some within the last year, some of you within the last days, last weeks, a month. It's difficult sometimes to know where you're going to go from where you are. Someone is missing in your life. And there is a beautiful story that is told about Gracie Allen and George Burns, that great um, couple, comedian couple who were married for many, many long years. Most of you perhaps don't remember them in, as comedians. You may have known George Allen because he lived 32 years after Gracie died in 1960. Four, I believe it was. And I wouldn't really know who they were, but there was a lot of reruns that showed up as I was growing up that dealt with a, a show that they once had. When Gracie died, George was actually uh, devastated. And one of the things he held on to and continued to give him joy and helped him move forward was a little slip of paper on which Gracie had written, written these words. It said, never place a period where God has placed a comma. Never place a period where God has placed a comma. We don't know what's coming next. And in fact, God can open up great things when our world has fallen apart if we continue to believe and continue to look 
and continue to believe that God is going to make a difference. Now, one of the things we run into is that people will often say that uh, you can't prove the resurrection. No, we cannot prove the resurrection from a scientific basis, although there are hints of it. After all, uh, we're told that every five to seven years, our bodies can, are continuing to be remade. All the cells in our bodies die within that period of time and are renewed and remade, and it doesn't change our personalities. So death, the suddenness of death, should not, in one sense, change who we might become in resurrection. However, uh, we also need to understand some other things. That is that God often changes our perspective to go back to that, um, that Baptist preacher. A pastor tells about a Christian man and his wife who lost their young son in a tragic accident on Good Friday, 1996. And while I wouldn't want to do it, they made the choice of having their son's service, funeral service, on Easter afternoon. And the father, very teary-eyed, made this statement. He said, until you stare death eye to eye, Easter is just a word. It's a nice day with bunny rabbits and eggs. But when someone so precious to you dies, Easter becomes everything. An acre in a fierce storm, a rock in which to stand, a hope that raises you above despair and keeps you going. For many of you who have had great loss, I hope you understand that that loss might be a comma, not a period. Next, it's a dark world without Easter, but on the other hand, Easter often heralds the bursting forth of every blossom of springtime. I was amused to read about an elementary school class that was given a test, and one of the questions was, upon what do hibernating animals subsist during the winter? The answer is supposed to be stored up body fat. But one student said that they subsist on hope. <laughs> and it really wasn't wrong. Because a lot of times we do continue on because of hope. A good illustration of this um, can be seen in a, a doctor by the name of Jane McAdams um, was shocked to discover that her 68-year-old mother was diagnosed with a, a very progressive, fast-moving lymphoma. Her doctors had given her less than a month to live. The daughter had said that she would talked to her mother about the prognosis, and she went to see her. She was in the hospital at that point, and as she walked into her room, her mother was looking at a catalog, just going back a couple of years, a catalog of spring accessories for women, including some very expensive purses. And before the doctor could say anything uh, to her mother, the mother said, you know, I really would like this purse for my birthday. It was a very expensive purse. The doctor recognized at that point that her mother was not asking for that purse. She was basically saying, am I going to live long enough to buy the purse? And the doctor's next words were, Mom, I'll go out and get that for you. And for the next 15 years, every spring, she would go out and buy her mother a new purse, an expensive purse. Because her mother didn't die until the age of 83. All that time she dealt with that lymphoma. What she was looking at was not the purse, but do I have hope? And the story of Easter is telling us we always have hope. We have a God of hope. We have a Lord of hope. This is a church of hope. 
God always has a trick up his sleeve. Never underestimate what God can do. This leads me to one last thing, and that's thanks God for Easter. I said that we can't scientifically prove life beyond the grave, but we do have a historical evidence. Theologian and author Wolfhart Pannenberg once said, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is so strong that nobody would question it except for two things. One is a very unusual event. And second, if you believe it, you have to change the way you live. And his contention is most of those who want to doubt the resurrection doubt it not because they find the resurrection hard to believe, but because they don't want to change their lives to fit the resurrection. Think about that. How many alcoholics will say, I know I shouldn't drink, but they don't want to give up their alcohol. Or I should stop smoking, but... And on and on we can talk about all the things we shouldn't do, but... And so I leave you this morning by asking you the question, are you one of those buck people who just won't change your life? There is a powerful message in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it requires you and I to accept it. And to accept it means putting our lives into a different focus and doing different things. If Christ is risen, then we become his servants. We become his people. We become his instruments in the world around us. Are we going to be resurrected people? Or are we going to be but people? The choice is up to each and every one of us. Our closing hymn reminds us of what the choice should be.